folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm doing a movie review this week. It's a psychological thriller that was based on a novel by Thomas Harris, and it came out in 1986 called Manhunter, which uh, the original title was called Red Dragon, but the Italian film producer Daniel De Laurentiis decided to change it to simply Manhunter because he didn't want this to affect his last film in 1985 that he produced called Year of the Dragon which was directed by Michael Chimero and starred Mickey Wark which actually became a box office bomb well this movie didn't do so well at the box office either it was released by his production company De Laurentiis Entertainment Group which uh, was the same company that released films like Raw Deal with Arnold Schwarzenegger you know, as well as uh, Transformers the Movie you know, Maximum Overdrive with Emilio Estevez and, and of course Blue Velvet with Dennis Hopper and, and Kyle McLaughlin as well as Isabel Vazzolini which was directed by David Lynch yeah. which of course was the production company that he took over um, after absorb um, Embassy Pictures, you know, the film division from Norman Lear. This was um, Michael Mann's um, adaptation of of a popular Thomas Harris novel, yeah, you know, that focuses on a cannibalistic serial killer named Hannibal Lecter, which was actually spelled Lecter with an, with L E. C K T O R instead of L E C T E R, yeah, for obvious reasons. But I guess they just wanted to make it more different than it is, yeah. And this is, of course, the theatrical version that was released on Blu ray by MGM and, and 20th Century Fox. Which, uh, sad to say, um, this one doesn't have any extras at all, it's, it's completely bare bones. But the transfer of this movie is in, is definitely pristine. It looks very good. Yeah, it definitely looked as stunning as I remembered it. So in fact, it's probably the best this movie had ever looked. And it did have grain in it too. But I remember seeing how how beautifully shot it was. You know, the cinematography that they put into this movie. You know, with all the color temperatures of of the shot of the beach and as well as the the dark atmosphere that they put into it, you know, and all the rest they had, it just looks, you know, spectacular. And it's also very thrilling too. And of course the the cover art that they chose for this movie, yeah, I, I didn't like this one. But it could have been worse because even the previous releases that came out before this, um, yeah, they had extras that were released by Anchor Bay. Yeah, Anchor Bay had released free DVD versions of the same film that has tons of extras. They even had the director's cut. And boy, uh, it, some way down the road I'll probably buy those if I ever get a chance. Maybe they might have it at Goodwill or, or thrift stores or anything. Yeah, because I know they're out of print. So who knows. Uh, or I can probably get it on Amazon if I have to. But this is the only way I had to get this movie because you know it does look really good, and I always I always enjoy this version more than than it is because this became my personal favorite of of them all. This and the Silence of the Lambs that came out in 1991, yeah, the film that actually won five Academy Awards in a category, you know, which of course was directed by John Van Damme. Stars Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins, you know, who's playing the role as Hannibal Lecter. And this one, of course, was played by Brian Cox, you know, in one of his earlier roles. Yeah, it's not his first movie, though, but it would be his, his earlier role that he ever did. And, and I thought he was actually very good as Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, kind of... Yeah, you know, kind of, you know, chilling at times, and I mean, it, it was a different version of him, so you could tell how it is. And uh, William L. Peterson, or simply William Peterson, 
that somehow people like to refer to. Well, yeah, he, he, he had a start in a movie called To Live and Die in L.A., which was directed by William Friedkin. You know, gave us the French Connection and The Exorcist. Yeah, this was definitely his start, you know, by being chosen for the for the role of of William Graham because because the director, Michael Mann, actually saw the footage and he thought, you know, he would be good for the part. You know, because they had a lot of actors that they were going to chose to play William Graham. In fact, hard to believe, but Daniel Dan Laurentiis actually wanted uh, Mel Gibson as well as Paul Newman and and Richard Gere to play the role. Yeah, I would have imagined how different it would have been if they actually had chose these actors instead of William Peterson. Yeah, it would be a whole different story. Yeah. Well, anyway, let, let's uh, get to the review because uh, I really enjoy this movie and, and I want to be able to talk more of it. And I'll, I'll probably uh, get to review all the Hannibal Lecter movies that I have in my collection. Uh, yeah, I, I now have four of them now. I don't have the, the last one, which was called uh, Hannibal Rising, which I heard it wasn't that good. It, it was a prequel. You know, all the way back before this whole thing began. So, But it's great that uh, I got all these movies. Yeah, three of them on Blu-ray. Um, the third movie, of course, was DVD. And it had extras. So, okay. but anyway, let's, let's, let's get right to it. The movie stars William Peterson, Tom Noonan, Dennis Farina, Kim Grease, Brian Cox, Joan Allen, and Stephen Lane. And it's written and directed by Michael Mann. The movie begins when a former FBI agent, Will Graham, who's played by William Peterson, has soon retired due to a an actual breakdown who actually went on a brutal attack by a cannibalistic serial killer named Dr. Hannibal Lecter, who was played by Brian Cox. He was approached by an FBI superior named Jack Crawford, who's played by Dennis Farina, who was actually assigned him to, to seek on a new serial killer case, which then Graham had to promise his wife was played by Kim Grace, that he would do nothing more than examine evidence and not risking any physical harm. So he actually agrees to visit the most recent crime in Atlanta, where he tries to enter the mindset of the killer, which turns out to be Francis Dollahide, a.k.a. the Tooth Fairy, who's played by Tom Noonan. Which basically what he does was he left teeth marks on the victims. While well, having to find the killer's fingerprints, you know, Graham meets with Crawford as they already been accosted by a tabloid journalist named Freddie Longs, who's played by Stephen Lane. Who, of course, Graham himself had a bitter history with him, which, you know... His paper basically just run tons of photographs of Graham, you know, taken secretly while he was hospitalized. You know, and the fact that, you know, he was talking about more, you know, stories about what happened in the past. So then later, Graham had paid a visit to Hannibal Lecter, who indeed was, of course, a former psychiatrist. He wants up in, in his white cell and asks for the insights of the killer's motivations. But after that one brief, tense conversation, you know, Lecter finally agrees to, to look at the case file and he later contrives to obtain Graham's uh, home address by deceit. So in Birmingham, Alabama, Graham had traveled to his first crime scene where he was already contacted by Crawford, who tells him that Lon's tabloid story is on the case. Which then, all of a sudden, Crawford had patched uh, Graham through Frederick Chilton, you know, who was played by Benjamin Henriksen, you know, who was Lecter's warden, 
who has found a note in Lecter's personal effects. By reading it, it reveals that there was a letter that was written particularly by the Tooth Fairy alone. So, of course, with that aside, they had to um, they had to try to figure it out where it came from. So they had to keep bringing it to to all the other FBI academies, you know, to figure out what was happening. But then after, um, but then suddenly um, after all of this, Freddie has been um, kidnapped by uh, Francis Dolahide during that uh, particular scene. You know, after you know, you know, he was taking pictures with Will Graham, you know, during another you know gossip. He had soon had um, taken him inside his lair, or this rate his house, where he actually started to. Um, torture him and actually started showing you know photographs of of the family that he just killed yeah where he just he basically just shows he was just wearing a cap over his face and he was just and he was just you know showing the all these clips that that he just found you know all these photographs as a slideshow you know telling them to see and all that He's even trying to tell him to open his eyes, or I'm gonna, or I'm gonna staple them quite shut. Well, anyway, yeah, he wants up uh, torturing him completely until, you know, he was asked to not do it again. So as a result of this, you know, during that that next shot, you know, we know what happens to him next was that he gets, uh, he wants up in the chair already tied up and already and suddenly he was on fire <laughs> yeah which it actually went straight inside the the screen yeah near the uh, the parking garage yeah when you saw the the parking garage guard you know screaming for his life as it started to come right down yeah it was a very messed up scene anyway now Graham was also told by Crawford that that he had cracked the Lecter's code message you know, to the True Fairy by giving the home address and and with the instruction to kill his family, which is going to be at the end save yourself or kill them all. So yeah, he also explains that um, there's actually one scene in the movie where you know Graham actually rushes home, you know, to find his family. You know, so they can have them safe, so they they don't wind up getting terrified by the two killers out there. You know, after what happened. So yeah, that's where they had that one scene where they actually went to the supermarket. Yeah, where Graham had explained to his son. You know that. Um, I mean, how did all of this had happened? How he had to. How did he have to capture um, Hannibal Lecter and all of this? Was because. Because of what. It, of what was happening to him and you know, how did he actually do all this yeah, and, and it was a deep explanation behind this I'm not going to get too much of that but it was one of those scenes particular great moments where he actually explained his son about how, how did all this had happened and I thought that was really a very touching moment right there because now you know how this was going to go yeah, and of course you saw all these cereal boxes uh, in the background with all the, uh, yeah, all the cereals that, like Cocoa Puffs and all the rest. And of course, uh, in the other background, they were about to get coffee. Yeah. Then there was another shot where he was explaining his wife that you know he's going to try his best to stop, you know, the Tooth Fairy, you know, from harming everybody, all the way around. And, his wife was warning him that he's going to get get sick and you're going to be killed. You know, if this happens. So, so as a result of this, he finally went on his mission and he actually uh, went inside the coffee shop. You know, just grab a cup of coffee, and he looks up on the window. You know, while it was raining, and he says, "This, it's you and me now, sport. I'm going to find you, God damn it." Yeah. So, still he was, um, so all this time he was actually, uh, trying to, 
you know, figure out all the clues and all the, the facts that's happening while he was with uh, Jack Crawford. Especially when he was watching those videotapes of home movies involving the family victims that they got killed. Yeah, because he was watching them earlier at his hotel room that he stayed for the night. And he was trying to figure out all the pieces that he had to deal with. Yeah, right in his mind he had to start talking about it through those videotapes. And then by the time um, he heard that uh, that the killer was going for the next victim, which turns out to be a blind woman named Reba McLean, who's played by Joan Allen. Yeah, which uh, at the time, yeah, during the the middle part of the film, you know, Dollar High was actually watching home movies of the family victims that he took. Yeah, he was watching it with her, and then they started making love after that. You know. With that aside, yeah, he later actually killed um, Reba's friend. Yeah, at, you know, once once he was gonna go back and, and meet her again. Yeah, because there was that scene, you know, while the song the "Strong as I Am" by the Prime Movers was playing, it was when he actually rips uh, the the piece of a entire um, cover out of that. It was it was really uh, really scary. Intentionally moving. Yeah, he also punches the um, the mirror. Yeah, he he's very strong. I mean, the way this character really is, he's as strong as ever. He's also very quiet too. He doesn't speak as much. I mean, he's given some words here and there. I mean, this is the perfect villain that we ever had. After you know, Graham had figured out all the connections between the murder families out there. Yeah, he finally. Um, went over there trying to um, stop you know, the Tooth Fairy to, to actually attack which apparently at this rate Dollar High was already playing the song um, In the God of the Beta by Iron Butterfly and was about to uh, terrorize uh, Reba by actually breaking the mirror yeah, by punching it and actually trying to grab a, a shard of glass and was ready to, to attack her and as soon as we know it, all the FBI agents, yeah, the SWAT team was going to go uh, after them. Yeah, because they were planning to attack the guy. Unfortunately, uh, Graham wants up being alone, you know, while he has all of his uh, team back up. So he wants up going straight. He saw, you know, Dollar Hyde with uh, Reba already being attacked. And then, yeah, and then after that, he was racing against time by actually. <laughs> running all the way straight to the window as it crashes right in this was definitely the best part then suddenly you know trying to save uh, Reba and then suddenly uh, Dalhide actually uses the the shard of glass and and slashes his face and, and throw him all the way straight to the the refrigerator and he fell in yeah as the refrigerator opens with a lot of food coming right out yeah, then, yeah, Reba had to, uh, had to leave out of the scene, trying to run away from, from being attacked. And then, of course, uh, Delahide brought in the shotgun and actually winds up shooting all the cops on, on the back. Yeah, it has one of those editing techniques that Michael Mann has done. And then, by the end of the film, you know, Graham finally got up and actually shot... Dollar hide completely until he's finally, you know, dead. He actually dies on the ground like this. Yeah. Well, blood's starting to come right out. So, so um, Graham finally saved Reba from from Dollar hide and and the case was uh, closed. And by the end of the film, you know, Graham is finally back with his family inside the inside his Florida home, and everything just went back to normal as it seems so yeah I mean th this is a really good film I, I really enjoy um, the way this movie was going for it's definitely the best um, film that Michael Mann has done after he started doing you know the movie Thief with uh, James Caan yeah it was a it was a caper film that was made at the time 
And of course, he was already doing the TV series uh, Miami Vice. So this was interesting because he even got some of the actors from who was had appeared on Miami Vice episodes, including Dennis Farina, you know, who was sad to say uh, passed away in 2013 due to a blood clot. But he was been a, in several films. You know, he was in movies like Snatch, Out of Sight with uh, George Clooney and Jennifer Lopez. He also had a, a role in, in the movie Another Stakeout, you know, which had that one funny scene you know, where he has to ate the ice cream a lot. <laughs> yeah, I remember that scene. And of course, Midnight Run and the TV series Crime Story, which aired on NBC that same year that this movie came out. So it was cool. Uh, William Peterson did a very good job playing the role as Will Graham. And quite honestly, this was the role that he definitely didn't expect from him because he was really into roles like this because this would be his precursor to the TV series CSI, uh, which he was on back in the in the early 2000s. Sort of almost a little similar to his Will Graham role, but quite different. Yeah. Yeah, the the TV show that was on CBS. Yeah, which is one of the most long-running series of all time. And yeah, it had a great cast too. Uh, Brian Cox was actually as uh, creepy and chilling in the role that would soon be later be played by Anthony Hopkins. And which I know Anthony Hopkins did a great job playing that role later on. So... But Brian Cox was great. I mean, this was an earlier role for him to play Hannibal Lecter. So this was like an earlier version of him, so in, in comparison. But, you know, I, I would imagine what it had been like if Brian Cox had gotten the role for The Science of the Lands. Then, then I think it would have been a whole lot different. I mean, I would imagine him winning an Oscar for that role. <laughs> but it's still, yeah... Uh, but yeah, it had some great cinematography. Uh, I love the soundtrack that they also chose. I mean, it had, yeah, wonderful soundtrack, um, including some of the 80s songs that they chose, like Heartbeat and Strong As I Am, and, and of course, the, the classic, which I believe it's from the uh, 60s or 70s. Well, yeah, well, at this rate, it's, it's, it's around that time called In the God of the Vita, so I thought that worked pretty well to add that in the mix considering how long that song was. It just made it up for the film. And yeah, um, it, it was uh, beautifully shot. Um, it looks as stunning as it ever looked. I mean, from a Michael Mann movie. I mean, it's very stylish. It, it does look very stylish for its time, so they knew exactly what Michael Mann had to offer. It was perfect, you know, it was the best adaptation that he had to offer. And this was way before we had the 2002 adaptation of the same novel, you know, which is called Red Dragon, because of the idea of of showing the, the great Red Dragon paintings, uh, that's why they call it Red Dragon. Yeah. I know there was supposed to be a shot, which is in the background, right here where he was actually had a a tattoo of the red dragon that Tom Noonan had but we didn't see that um, it's supposed to be on there actually unless that was in the director's cut but I, I don't know I guess this was just part of the poster that they were chosen because he didn't have a tattoo on on the back you know, until later when they did the, the adaptation which I know Way Fines had played a role, so this was different. Yeah. And I'll I'll get to I'll get to reviewing all the other Hannibal Lecter films uh, later on, and I would love to review Red Dragon too to see the difference, because I know it was supposed to be faithful to the Thomas Harris novel, so yeah, it's perfect for what it is, and they knew that that's what they were going for. But anyway, um, great movie. Wonderful score, a lot of great action scenes, a lot of technique editing that he put in, you know, some of those fast uh, pace editing shots that he did. It's kind of like cuts one scene to another. I guess Michael Bann loves to do that 
with his movies because that's what he did with with the movie Thief you know, during the end part of the film. It's like it, it just goes real fast. Yeah. So yeah, um, I definitely recommend this movie for those who haven't seen this or for those who have because I know it's 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 an excellent movie in my book and give it a try. I mean definitely buy this movie on Blu-ray and DVD yeah for the theatrical version and and if you want to check out the, the director's cut yeah definitely try to f uh, track down a rare copy of it from Anchor Bay with all the extras that they have they also have the theatrical cut included as well so yeah definitely check it out so anyway I give Manhunter a solid and intriguing psychological thriller five stars I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.